Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to The Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to The Pastor Study. In 1993, in Waco, Texas, 80 people died because of following David Koresh. They, he was a false messiah, claimed to be the messiah, but these 80 people died for a false messiah. Before that, in 1978, 909 people died in uh, Ghana uh, because of Jim Jones. He was a fake messiah, but uh, people were willing to die for that fake messiah. Here's my question for you today. Christians, we believe in the real Messiah, Jesus Christ. Are we willing to die for him? Every month I get this. You can go to persecution.org and get it for free. It's the Persecution Magazine. It'll tell you month after month of people who have been kidnapped, beaten, beheaded sometimes, had their churches or their homes uh, burned down because of their faith in Jesus. So what, what I want us to do today on, on, in this message is to ask ourselves the question, am I willing to die for Jesus? Would you take out your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 21? Paul and his little missionary band are traveling around the Roman Empire preaching the gospel. And let's learn all that we can from this passage. Acts chapter 21, let's pray first. Father, we do want to pray for Christians in the Sudan, Indonesia, India, China, uh, uh, just all over the world that are suffering for Christ. Lord, keep them faithful. May they be willing to die for you if necessary. And we pray for that, that for us in America, we have it so easy compared to them. Lord, help us be willing to die for you and teach us now about this. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 21, starting at verse 7. And we, the, Paul and this little band of uh, evangelists, we had finished our journey from Tyre and we arrived at Ptolemaeus. And after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. And on the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. And entering the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Here's the first lesson I want you to get today. God wants you to be a virgin until you're married. These were four, four virgin daughters. And it's true for guy, girls and guys. It's the same rule. If you're male if, or if you're female, God's rule for you is this. If you're married, you're faithful to your spouse. If you're single, you're celibate. You're a virgin until you get married. Yes, it is possible. I know that MTV and Hollywood and Planned Parenthood will basically give you the message you're weak or going to do it anyway, just use a condom. That's a lie. For 2,000 years, millions of Christians have been virgins before they were married. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying it's possible. When I was about 16, 17 years old and my friends were getting drunk on the weekends and bragging about their sins, I couldn't bring myself to do that. And you know one big reason? I read my Bible every night. And I want to ask the adults watching this show, do you read your Bible regularly? And uh, let's talk to the adults about virginity, not the teenagers for a moment. Um, adults, do you know that it's just as much a sin for you to fornicate at age 65 at a, than at age 16? I mean, what, years ago when I moved into my townhouse complex, the couple next to me in their 50s living together, not being married. People next to them in their 60s living together, not being married. And, well, Pastor, but we can handle it. We're more mature. No, you can't. It's still a sin to have sex outside of marriage, a serious sin. 
I mean, uh, years ago when I was in college, a dear girl that I grew up with, Sue, and I still know her, I think she did stuff she shouldn't have, and she says to me one day, Tom, premarital sex may be okay for other people, it's not okay for me. And I said to her, Sue, it's not okay for anybody. First Corinthians chapter 6 says fornicators don't go to heaven. If you're 65 and you're living and you're having sex outside of marriage, your eternal salvation is at hand. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11. Look at verse 9. It says, Philip had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Here's the next lesson. God can use single people in a mighty way. These virgin daughters were prophesying. So if you're single, maybe you're married, you're, you're divorced, that is, or you're a widow, or you've never been married, that's not a curse. In fact, 1 Corinthians 7 says God can use you even more. So just, uh, if you're single, God can use you in a mighty way. You can, you can choose to fornicate instead, but you'll pay for it. God won't use you if, if you're living in sin. One more thing. If you're watching this show and you've blown it, you've had sex outside of marriage, I just want to say this. We live and serve a loving, forgiving God. And I heard of a woman, she calls herself a born-again virgin. She blew it. She had sex outside of marriage. She repented. She asked Christ's forgiveness. And now her, her commitment is, I'm not having sex again until I'm married. <laughs> then let's look at... Verse 10. And as we were staying there for some days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard this, we, as well as the local residents, began begging Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. And, you know, this is normal. Paul, you brought me to Christ. You led me to the Lord. I don't want you to go to Jerusalem and, and, and get beat up. But here's the next lesson. Have you given God permission to bring suffering into your life if it's for his glory? Paul was willing to go to Jerusalem and suffer for Christ because he knew God would be glorified through that. Have you given God permission to bring suffering into your life for his glory? I want you to hear a poem. The road is too rough, I said. Dear Lord, there are stones that hurt me so. He said, dear child, I understand. I walked it long ago. But there's a cool green path, I said. Let me walk there for a time. No child, he gently answered, the green road does not climb. My burden, I said, is far too great, how can I bear it so? My child, he said, I remember the weight I carried across, you know. But I said, I wish there were friends with me who would make my way their own. Ah, yes, he said, Gethsemane was hard to bear alone. And so I climbed the stony path, content at last to know that where my Savior leads me, that's the best for me to go. And though dark s storms await me, and suffering never ceases, this path leads me to heavenly home, and closer now to Jesus. And it's a hard prayer to pray, but are you willing to pray, Lord, if, if there's a suffering you want me to go through for your glory, I'm on board. <laughs> Look at verse 13. And Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, I want you to look at that verse. Could you say that? If you're having conversation, I mean, so if, we, if you're, you and I are in a conversation, and you said, Pastor Brock, are you willing to die for Jesus? And if I said, I am ready to die for Jesus, I bet you'd say, well, how do you know? <laughs> if it came right down to it, how do you know? And, and I will admit, I am more comfortable saying, 
I hope I would die for Jesus. But that's not what Paul says in this verse. He says, I am ready to die for Jesus. Well, how does Paul know that? It's because he risked his neck every day. I mean, read the book of Acts. They beat Paul up in one city for preaching. He goes to the next and he starts preaching. And then they beat him up and he goes to the next. And I do believe this. If you are presently living for Christ, you would die for him. But don't kid yourself. If you're not living for him, you wouldn't die for him. There's a story that during World War II, some Nazi soldiers Sunday morning burst into a church in Europe, went to the front with, with, the, with their machine guns, turned the machine guns on the people and said, if you're a Christian, we're going to kill you. If you're not really a believer in Christ, you can leave now. Some of the people got up and left. Some people were left in the church. Story goes that after the people had left, the soldiers went over and locked the doors of the church, came back up to the front, put their machine guns on the table, and said to the remaining people, tell us about Jesus. We want to hear about him from some real Christians. I do believe if you are presently living for Jesus, you would die for him. But again, don't kid yourself. If you're not living for him, you wouldn't die for him. Look at verse 14. And since Paul would not be persuaded, <laughs> here's, you know, that's what I love about the Apostle Paul. If he knew God was telling him something, he didn't care. Nobody could persuade him otherwise. Uh, I, I know a pastor like that. I, I have a lot of respect for this pastor. This pastor is stubbornly biblical. And if the Bible says something, he preaches it. And people get upset with him, but he keeps preaching it. I'll tell you the instance. There was a clause in his church, the, the congregational uh, constitution, that if you drink wine, you can't be a member of our Baptist church. Well, this pastor said, where's that in the Bible? And I think his point was, then Jesus and the apostles couldn't be members of our Baptist church? <laughs> and he, he you know, worked to get that thrown out. And boy, people got mad at him. But what, uh, th this is my next lesson. Here it is. Be an Apostle Paul. Be stubbornly biblical. You know, they talk about teenagers are rebellious. We live in a day and age in which I want the teenagers to be rebellious. If you're a teenager, rebel against MTV. Rebel against Hollywood. Rebel against some of the rock lyrics. Re rebel against the lies of Planned Parenthood and be the Apostle Paul and stubbornly be, bi be biblical. <laughs> Look at verse 14. And when Paul would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. Here's the next lesson. Submit yourself to God's will. The early Christians here are submitting themselves. Okay, Paul, if it's God's will for you to suffer, for is your, okay, we submit to that, Paul. This is a true story from 156 AD. Polycarp is an old man. He's the Bishop of Smyrna. He sat under the teaching of the Apostle John. But now all the original apostles are dead, and Smyrna, uh, 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 Polycarp is an old man now, and he's living under persecution. An angry mob in Asia calls for the death of Polycarp. The police captain arrests him and says, Why, old man, what harm is there in saying Caesar is Lord and offering incense to him and saving yourself? Polycarp refused. They let him into the arena. The proconsul of Asia tried to persuade Polycarp, have respect for your age, Polycarp, swear by the divinity of Caesar, and repent. Polycarp refused. He was pressed by the proconsul, take the oath, and I will let you go. Revile Christ. And then the aged Polycarp says this, Eighty-six years have I served him. He has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my Savior and my King? And Polycarp was burned at the stake, 156 A.D. I wonder if in my lifetime persecution will start in the United States. We have it a little bit, but not much. But you know, recently a politician said 
that if churches don't start performing gay weddings, I want to take away their tax-exempt status. That was said recently by a politician. If persecution comes to the United States, can you say with the Apostle Paul, I'm ready to die for Jesus? And I want to close with this. This is from the Presbyterian Survey magazine. A person had a dream. And in the dream, I was in heaven, though how I got there and when, I could not tell. I was one of a great multitude from a huge number from all countries, peoples, times, and ages. Somehow I found out that the saint who stood next to me had been in heaven for 1,800 years. Who are you, I said to him. I was a Roman Christian, he said. I lived in the days of Nero, and I was covered with pitch and fastened to a stake and set on fire to light Nero's gardens. How awful, I exclaimed. No, he said, I was glad to do something for Jesus who died for me. The man on the other side then spoke. I have been in heaven only a few hundred years. I came from an island in the South Seas. John Williams was my missionary and came and told me about Jesus. They killed him and they cannibalized me. How terrible, I said. No, he said, I was glad to die as a Christian. You see, the missionaries had told me that Jesus was scourged and crowned with thorns for me. Then they both turned to me and said, what did you do to suffer for him? Or did you sell what you had so missionaries like John Williams could take the good news to the heathen? I was speechless. And while they both were looking at me with sorrowful eyes, I woke up. It was a dream. I lay on my soft bed awake for hours, thinking of the money I had wasted on my own pleasures and how little I had done. Are you willing to die for Jesus? I just, it's only by the grace of God any of us would, but before persecution hits, I just think we should regularly pray, and I do, I pray. I pray for the persecuted church on Tuesdays often, and I pray for people around the world that are dying for Christ, and my prayer is, Lord, help me be willing to die for you if it comes down to it. And I encourage you to do that too. Lord, I'm a wimp on my own, but would you give me the courage, if it comes right down to it, that I would die for you? In the meantime, help me live for you. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor's study where we now ask Pastor Brock to share with us his knowledge of scripture and his insights to answer questions we have regarding the Bible, our Lord, and our everyday walk with him. In light of your sermon today, if a Christian denies Christ under persecution, can he be forgiven? You know, Jackie, when I pray for the persecuted church, I pray, Lord, help them stand firm and not deny you. But then I always pray this too. But if they do, Lord, may they repent and may you forgive them and take them back. Because Jackie, can we think of somebody from the New Testament who three times denied the Lord and he was forgiven? That would be and Peter. That would be Peter and who became one of the leaders of the church. So yes, there's forgiveness if there's true repentance, but honestly, I'd rather die than have to live with the fact that I had denied Christ. So that's what I pray for for me. Yeah, help me die before I do that. So what countries still persecute Christians? Yeah. Or better yet, what countries persecute Christians the most? Well, I was just at a missions conference. India is terrible. Nepal is terrible. Uh, the Muslim lands. Uh, in, do you know, Jackie, there are more Muslims in Indonesia than in all of the rest of the Muslim countries combined. So Indonesia has some pretty horrible uh, persecution going on. So those are the, some of the countries that persecute the most. But all of these countries have missionaries going. They're just not listening to them, or well, uh, there's no Actually, them? they say the, uh, uh, hint, uh, let's see, Nepal, until a few years ago, was the only Hindu nation left on earth. And now, Nepal is the fastest growing church on earth, but 
They have just passed an anti-conversion law in order to snuff out the movement of the Christian gospel. We need to pray for the Christians in Nepal and in India. They're trying to pass an anti-conversion law. So those are two countries we need to pray for. Okay. If an older couple lives together unmarried for tax purposes, but their pastor has performed their, a non-legal marriage, mm -hmm. is that okay? I don't think it is. And I, I know of a pastor and this older couple comes saying, look, we don't want to lose uh, pension or social security. So pastor, would you just pray that we're married and then we'll be married? And he did it. I wouldn't do that. It's called defrauding the government, Jackie. And if people are living in sin and they're 80 years old and they're doing it for the sake of money, what are you teaching your grandkids? What are you teaching your kids? It's, if grandma can shack up with her boyfriend, why can't I shack up with mine? I would say no, either you're married and have sex, and if you're not married, you abstain from sex. Okay, Tom, since you brought up premarital sex, mm -hmm. where does the Bible say that premarital sex is wrong. I would encourage people to read 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where the Apostle Paul says, better to marry than to burn. <laughs> and so that's 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and chapter <clears throat> 7. Okay, what does it mean to prophesy in the New Testament? And is this happening today? Mm -hmm. This is a two-part question Right, <laughs> and in, in that passage from Acts 21, it said that Philip had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Well, prophecy is, it can be kind of like, kind of like preaching, but it's more of an immediate thing, a message from the Lord, more immediate, that's supposed to be tested by the other prophets. And does, is, does it happen today? I think there are pro people that have the gift of prophecy, and they'll kind of speak a word from the Lord, but it always has to be tested against written scripture, because people sometimes think their emotions are the word of the Lord, you know. Okay, I can understand that, <laughs> I guess. So, what does it mean to prophesy in the New Testament, and is this happening? Yeah, that, that's what I mean, is Jackie, there, that in the, New Test, in the Old Testament, prophecy was kind of more of a forth telling of the future often, but not always. Even, even the Old Testament prophets would kind of do sermons, and it was prophecy. But in the New Testament, it's a little more immediate and needs to be tested in the New Testament. Okay. This one's probably one you're not going to like me to okay. ask, but people do, I think. Yeah. Is it okay for women to preach over adult men? We're uh. seeing more women ministers. Oh, we sure are. And Jackie, I think women can prophesy. Philip had four virgin daughters who prophesied. I think women can do prophesying. They can share their faith. There's all kinds of stuff women can do. But there's one thing they are not to do, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul says, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man in church. So if you go to a church and the woman pastor is preaching over adult men, I, I wouldn't go to that church. I don't want to sit under that because it's, it's violating scripture. And people say, well, that was just that day and age. And Well, wait a minute. Jesus chose 12 male apostles. He could have chosen six men and six women. He didn't. He wanted the leadership of his church to be male. Just because if, I, I just talked to a missionary recently on this. He said, if you have a woman pastor over a church in some of these like India and Thailand or whatever, ends up to be mostly women that attend the church and the men just don't. And it's just kind of the way we're made, Jackie. So I would honor those scriptures and not ordain women. Okay. But we're getting to have more female ministers we certainly in our churches are. today. I know, and the churches are shrinking. So, I'm sorry. It's I just, mean, if yeah. you have somebody come to your church that becomes a minister that's female, yeah. are you supposed to leave that church? I would. Or? I, again, Paul says, 1 Timothy chapter 2, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. He's talking about in the church, in the, in the worship. And so I, I just was talking to, to a pastor about that, and he said, I couldn't sit under the, the preaching of a woman if she's the main preacher over a church. Okay. Yeah. Can anyone really know if they would die for Christ? You mm -hmm. know, that's, you know, people say, well, I, I do this. Yeah. But... Would they really? Well, again, like we said in the sermon, 
I'm much more comfortable saying, I hope I would die for Christ. But that's not what the Apostle Paul says in Acts 21. Mm -hmm. He says, I am ready to die for Christ because he died for Christ every day. I mean, that poor guy got beaten up from one city to the next. So I think Paul could say it, <laughs> and he ultimately did. According to early church history, Paul was beheaded. So, You know, it's, it's hard to imagine what people had to go through when Christ was really on earth and what they must have the decisions they had to make oh, yeah. and we think we have it tough today mm -mm. oh <laughs> right yeah so what can we do in america for those people who are being prosecuted overseas well, and other places yes i want to encourage everybody go to persecution.org and for free you can get a magazine called persecution it comes to my house every month uh Wonderful, inspiring stories, but horror stories as well of what is happening to our brothers and sisters in Christ overseas. So I think the first step is to get, get knowledgeable. Start praying for these people. I, like I said, I like to pray on Tuesdays for the persecuted church. And then as the Lord leads, support groups like this, persecution.org. Okay, but the, you, though, though that magazine is for other countries, and that, uh -huh. but we have it right here. We do, and, our, and I, I don't. They don't really cover America much in there, but we do, Jackie. I, like I said, that there's a certain politician who wants to force churches to do gay weddings, and if they won't, he wants to take away your your uh, tax exempt status. That's happening now. So. Well, Tom, I have some other questions, but we only we're down to one we minute are. in our show okay. today. So I think maybe you should just close and I'll save these for our next show. Let's do that? that. And everybody, let's let's take a minute and pray for Christians overseas. Can we do that? Lord God, we want to pray for Christians in Indonesia, Egypt, Nepal, India, Sri Lanka, just some of these uh, countries that just block the gospel and throw Christians in jail. Lord, we pray for the persecuted believers that you release them. But if they're to go through this for you, that you comfort them and fill them and their families with joy and meet their needs, Lord. And pray that we in America would stand strong for Christ and that you'd help us support these people overseas with our prayer, with our funds. Lord, just help us always be willing to die for Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. We'll see you again next time. Thank you for watching The Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org. Or write The Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always. If you've been blessed by the pastor's study, would you consider a tax-deductible gift to help us reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ? You can donate at our website, pastorsstudy.org, two S's, or mail a check to the pastor's study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55441. May the Lord bless you and have a wonderful week.